So welcome to the next part of this lecture. We're now looking into hash based signatures. So hash based signatures have a similar success history to code based cryptography. Both of them go back to the 70s and have had a very long history of security analysis and how we really understand what's going on. So here's a one slide summary of the advertisement parts, um, why you should care about hash based signatures and why you maybe even want to use those. So one nice feature is that you only need one good hash function. So while SHA-3 came from the SHA-3 competition not too many years ago, has been very well analyzed by the scientific community. And also you do need a hash function anyway, if you have a signature scheme. So when you're, when you're looking at signature schemes that you know from pre-quant cryptography, say the RSA signature scheme or DSA, Algamal, uh, at 2019, all of those have a step where they take a message which can have arbitrary length and map it to a fixed length, say, n bit hash of a message. And well, all hash based signatures need is this hash, hash function, well, repeatedly, but well, okay, if it's secure once, it should also be secure five times. What do we mean by cryptographic hash, hash functions being secure? So we have three requirements um, on the computational hardness. So that means Yes, they, you can always solve those theoretically, but it should be computationally impossible or it should be exponentially hard. Namely, what we want is that it's really hard to find any of the pre-images. Now you see from the definition here, well, hash function mapping from arbitrary long strings to fixed length strings, that means each output typically has many pre-images, but it should be hard to find any of those. So computationally, you shouldn't be able to find one if somebody gives you just the output. So that means, well, these are computational one-way functions. It should also be hard to find a second pre-image. So somebody gives you an X and the hash value of it, and then you, well, you know one pre-image of H of X, but you shouldn't be able to find another X prime, which is having the same image. Of course, if H would be an injective function, then there wouldn't even exist one. But since the, uh, the image set is, uh, the pre-image set is much, much larger, they typically do exist many, but you shouldn't be able to find them. And then finally, the requirement is that it's collision resistant. And now that removes even more restrictions from the attacker. So the attacker can find, or well, is asked to find any pair X prime and X, which are not equal, but have the same output. And even that should be hard. Now, if you can compute pre-images or second pre-images, then you can also find collisions, typically. But um, the other way around, well, collision finding takes for an n-bit output, takes 2 to the n over 2 without a quantum computer, and the other ones take 2 to the n. So it's not impossible to find those, but it's computationally very expensive for large enough n. And for instance, for the example I'm giving here, sha 3, 2, 50, 5, 12, n is 5, 12 long. So that means it would take 2 to the 256 operations to find a collision and 2 to the 512 to find a pre-image, a second pre-image. If you take a quantum computer in the mix, then you can, of course, apply Shor's, uh, Grover's algorithm. We don't see any way of applying Shor because there's no nice math structure in those, in those functions. And with Grover, getting a square root speed up on uh, pre-images and second pre-images. All right, so how do these wonderful hash based signatures work? Let's start with um, saying we want to sign an empty message. Now, here's an empty slide from an empty message. Uh, why should you care about empty messages? So if it's something where the message doesn't really matter because, well, it's only one thing you want to say. Say you're going on an excursion and you want to say you found an island and you find your pigeon and then you send back a message. Yes, I found an island. Anybody who gets this message from you knows it was you and you found an island. You don't have to write there that you found an island. So that's when you um, care about having, don't care about the message, it can be an empty message, but everybody wants to make sure it really was you. So what could you do? Well, you're an island explorer, but you also uh, know your cryptography and you know that hash functions are one-way functions. And so you say, well, if I remember the input to a hash function and tell everybody the output to the hash function, then if I ever release the input, then people know it was me because they can match it up. So here's the same thing in Python. Um, 
using some functions and you can find the code on the, on the course page. Um, as a secret here, we're picking 32 bytes, so 256 bits. And then we're just getting them from the operating system's uh, binding function. So that's what this command means there. It's good practice not to ever release uh, raw randomness because maybe your random number generation is broken or there's some information about the state from, from what you're releasing. So it's a good idea to hash that again. So the secret key is grabbing these 32 bytes and applying the hash functions one to it, once to it. Now, here we're not using the hash function to compress because it's 256 bits to begin with and it maps to 256 bit. But that's, well, 256 is one of the many possible input lengths of the hash function, so that's a valid thing. And now we have our secret key and then the public key is applying the hash function one more time. So our key pair for this empty signing, empty message signing, is the pre-image for the secret key and the image for the public key. So here's an example of this. We are grabbing some randomness, we're hashing it for the secret key and the public key, and here you can see those printed in ASCII, well, as, as hex numbers. Now to verify or to sign the empty message, well, you make sure that the message is really empty, else you complain, and then you're releasing the secret, this pre-image. So that's the signed message. And then somebody wanting to verify that this is you, making sure that you really found this island and everybody should be happy for you, then they take what is the, the signed message, well, which is well, the empty message with this secret key, and they're verifying that this actually hashes to your public key. If it doesn't hold, then you complain it's a bad signature, and else you release, well, in this case, the empty message. Okay, I could motivate signing empty messages, but let's sign a bit. So to sign a one-bit message, well, if not saying anything means we have an island, how about we make a key pair for the saying zero and a key pair for saying one. So then if I release the secret key for this key pair, I'm attesting that I mean to say zero. If I release the secret key for this key pair, I'm committing to one. So here now, I'm using this previous sign empty key pair generation function twice, once for the key pair S0, P0, and once for the S1 and P1. So again, S1 hashes to P1, S0 hashes to P0. And then the public keys are the P parts, and the secret keys are the S parts. And then to sign, I'm well, making sure that the message is either 0 or 1, and then I'm releasing the corresponding part. So you can see here a little bit about like which indices to grab. That's because I'm writing in the key pair generation that the secret key is S0 plus S1. Now these are just strings. So what Python is doing is it putting the S0 in the first 32 bytes and the S1 in the second 32 bytes. So that's what you see in these uh, brackets there. So those intervals are open on the right side. And so I'm getting the secret key bytes from 0 till 31 for the first, for signing 0, and from 32 till 63 for signing 1. Okay, so now somebody gets me to sign something, and so I'm either returning 0, comma, the secret key, or I'm returning 1, comma, the secret key. And then if I want to open this, then I'm getting the signature, I'm looking at the first part, if it's zero, and then I'm using the subroutine that I just had in the sign empty with the corresponding public key. I'm checking whether this, well, is actually the pre-image of the P0 part, or in the case of one, whether this is the pre-image of the P1 part. Now, if any of those two fails, well, say we signed, we signed one here, so we're releasing the pre-image of the one part, um, sign empty open, if this one is not matching, then it says it's a bad signature. Or in the zero case, it says it's a bad signature. So if it gets through there and hasn't gotten the if this one or if this one, then it complains that the message must be zero or one. Also, small comment on saying signed message here and open. Um, it's generally good practice, so if you ever find yourself implementing a crypto system, don't think of it as the message coming signature where the user can actually see the signature, uh, the message before verifying the signature, 
that is kind of risky from a, from a user interface perspective. It's much better if you only show a signed message where the user can't see anything until it's verified. So here you have the, the correct data flow, um, the computer looks, uh -huh, there's a zero, is it the correct signature on zero, and only then tells the user, yes, this was zero. And if it fails, you don't get to see any of the messages. Now here in the example, it was a valid signature of one, and so we're gonna see one. Yeah, I know if you're a curious person, you can still get it to see that the first bit is giving the message in plain text, but you're not supposed to. It's not telling you, hey, look, here is one and here's a signature on one. Okay, well, what's next? Two-bit messages, three-bit messages. Um, yeah, we still have a bit of time, right? Okay, let's jump ahead into four-bit messages. But do remember what we have in the signbit.py. So we have an open function on one bit, so sign bit key pair for generating the key pair, sign bit sign and sign bit open. So those take for each bit, they're having two public keys and two secret keys. Now with four byte messages, so now we want to have messages between zero and 15. Um, well, for each of those bits, we're generating a key pair from the sign bit function. So P0 now, for the zeros position here, that will be two public keys and two secret keys. P1 will be two public keys, two secret keys, depending whether this bit is zero or one. So sign bit already has a pair of those. And so we're doing this for the zero position, one position, two and three, meaning, well, it's powers of two. So the, the index after the P is a power of two. And so the public key is this pair for the zeroth position, this pair for the first position, second position, third position, and same for the secret key. And then in order to sign a message, um, don't worry too much about grabbing these things so there's a one ended with M rotated by something. Um, this is just some bit operation magic in order to get the correct bit. So the first thing extracts the bit, like the least significant bit, the one which belongs to two to the zero, as M1 is well, in the bottom line, you can actually see how these, these bits relate. So SM0 plus 2 times SM1 plus 4 times SM2 plus 8 times SM3 is the message you want to sign. And so that's what these uh, four rows of Python there do. They grab you the correct bit. And then on that bit, which can be 0 or 1, you're doing the sign bit operation. So it releases the corresponding secret key for the position and whether it's 0 or 1. And again, well, now it's just like, it's 32 bytes for 0 and 32 bytes for 1. So we're seeing 0 till 64, 64 till 128, etc. in gaps of 64 uh, bytes. And then to open the message, we're checking that the corresponding part in this in the signature, or in the signed message, um, is actually matching up with the public key parts. And so then we again, using the sign bit open from the previous slides to verify this. And if all of them hold, then we're returning the message composed from these binary parts. And each of these sign bit functions could complain that the message is out of range or could complain that one of those is not actually the pre-image of the public key. Now, one thing you should realize here is, well, for the other one, for the empty message, once you have signed it, everybody sees it. For the one bit message, okay, you've given away half of your secret keys, but you can't use it again because I mean, if once you've signed one, then you can't say one again and you could maybe say zero, but who knows, maybe you don't want to say zero the next time. So for those, it was clear that those are just one time signatures, but also for this four bit messages, it is dangerous to continue using it. So all of this setup, all of these four bits, each of which having two possible public keys, two possible secret keys, so each of them consuming 64 bytes, you can only use once. So for instance, here are two examples. So I've now done the dangerous thing and signed 11 and signed 17, uh, signed seven, both times using the same key pair. Short reminder, seven is 2 to the 2 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 0 and 11 is 2 to the 3 so 8 
plus 2 plus 1. Okay, so both of them overlap at the 2 to the 1 and 2 to the 0 position, but they don't, they have opposite values for the 2 to the 2 and 2 to the 3 position. And that means I can actually, like I as Eve, so I as a tagger, can actually use this to sign a different message to come up with a forgery. And my forgery is taking the last three positions from the seven signature, so the two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two. And then I'm getting the two to the three with the one from the signature from 11. And that means, well, I have a valid signature on 15 by just combining these two um, signatures together. And similarly, I could now also sign just five. So having the, uh, sorry, I could also sign three by putting zeros in those two positions. And of course, you don't want this to happen, so you must not release more than one signature under each public key. 